Today's scripture passage is in Genesis 44, 1 to 13. You're invited to turn there or follow along on the screen. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry, and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for his grain. And he did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Sorry about my nose. Um, Go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this cup my, my master's drink? And also you, my master's drink drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouths of our sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. This is God's word. Thanks, Melissa. Now, I have to say, first off, that um, I had a chance throughout the week to go back and listen to Stephen's message from two weeks ago and Jason's message from last week, and I just was blown away. I was just thrilled with um, the strength of what was communicated there, and I'm so grateful for these guys, and I just think this congregation is so much healthier for the depth that there is there. And uh, so thank you guys for sharing, and uh, thanks, congregation, for uh, being willing to hear from these guys. And they carried the ball forward so well that uh, we didn't miss a beat in going through the life of Joseph, even though I was away. So that's fantastic. Now, as we come to Genesis chapter 44, part of which was just read for you, I envision the roller coaster hill. You know, the roller coaster car is going up that first big hill and it's getting very close to the peak there. Not quite there. And you know that moment of tension when it's just like, it's just sort of, oh, you know it's going to go. Well, the roller coaster car is just about to that apex there and it's about to go over the top and descend. That's where you're at in the narrative of Joseph's life when you reach chapter 44. Now, in literary terms, they call it the denouement, which I think is a really cool French word, which basically means the unknotting, when that knot has been there is finally undone, okay? But actually, it's kind of the, it's the opposite when it comes to Joseph's story or any real story because it's all of these various threads that are actually coming together, and they're beginning to make sense now, and you see where it's going. So that's where you're at in the life of Joseph when you reach chapter 44. Now, Remember who this guy is. Remember where he has been. Remember that he's lived through unimaginable trauma for a whole lot of years now. He's lived through trauma, and he's also lived through extraordinary highs. And literally, he has gone from the dungeon to being a dignitary in the land of Egypt. And he's now the second most powerful man on the face of the planet at the time. And he's in charge of this humongous program, a governmental program, for the nation of Egypt, wherein he is responsible for food production and food storage and and food food dispersion or dispensing of it, and even for foreign aid. This is who Joseph is. And, And despite the fact that he is in such an extraordinary position with such such power, there is something that lingers in his heart. There is a pain that is still there that it won't go away. There is a sense of, of loss, a sense of hurt that has been there for all of these years. Now, 
I was wondering if you have ever been in a situation where you were living with a sort of dread over maybe ever encountering a certain person from your past with which maybe you had, had a falling out. Sometimes that happens. You have a falling out with somebody in years past and you just feel very awkward about ever running, them, running into them again. Or maybe you've lived with a dread over ever having had to, to encounter somebody who did you wrong when you were young. And what is it like to have to live with that kind of dread, just knowing that you might run into that person at some time and you think, well, what will I say? Or, or what will I do? How, what's the appropriate way to handle this? Some people live with that kind of dread. Now, there are other people in this room who live with a different kind of a thing over something that was done to them in the past. They kind of long for that day to come when they have that face-to-face -face again so that they can give them what for, so they can put them in their place. Now, Joseph, I don't think, was that way. But I think Joseph lived with a certain apprehension about what happens if I ever see this again, my brothers again, because of what they had done to me so many years ago. Well, guys, when you reach Genesis chapter 42, 43, and 44, you realize that that day has arrived for Joseph. It is there. Think, 22-ish years have passed since a 17-year-old kid who hardly had to shave was trafficked as a slave into a foreign land by his own flesh and blood, by his own brothers. It's been 22 years since Joseph has seen these brothers. It's been 22 years since he's had any news from home. And all of a sudden, these guys who did this to him show up standing right in front of him, and they don't know that it's him. What a wild scenario. That's what Joseph was living. Can you imagine how many thousands of times over 22-ish years Joseph has worked through in his mind what he might say to his brothers if he ever saw them again? Can you imagine how many thousands of times he might have played through different scenarios about what he should do if he should ever see those brothers again? I believe Joseph is human, and so all of this stuff has to have gone through his head many, many times. So his brothers show up after 22 years, and why do they show up? 42 tells us because of the famine. They were living in an area that was famine ravaged, just like Egypt was. But Egypt was the only place that had food. And so foreigners from these other places were flocking into Egypt because they knew that there was food, there was available grain in Egypt, all because of one man, Joseph. And so Joseph stands at the gate through which all of these foreigners will have to come if they expect to be able to remain alive. Joseph is the gatekeeper. Joseph has the keys to the food that everybody else needs. And I thought, I've told you that Joseph is a type of Christ in many ways. And this is one of the ways it, 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 it occurred to me as I was reading through this section this week. Jesus came and he said that he is the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And the implication is, if you will live, you must eat this bread, which is something that we symbolize with the bread and the cup all the time. And here is Joseph standing as the gatekeeper. Joseph has the bread and everybody needs it. And if you want the bread, you go through Joseph. So Joseph is, in a way, a picture of the life that Christ has for us. Now, Joseph, at this point in time, has all the power. As I said, he's a very powerful man. Joseph basically runs the world, in a manner of speaking, because the world has to come through him. But his brothers don't know who it is they're kneeling before. Here's this man with all this power, and they don't know it's their brother. They presumed years ago that he was dead. So here we find Joseph in a position in which he is kind of like God, in a sense. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression when I say that. Let me explain this. Joseph is in a position that is kind of God-like, in the sense that he knows who this is that's kneeling before him, but they don't recognize him. 
He can understand everything they're saying and thinking and feeling because he's one of their brothers. But they don't know that about him. They don't know that he understands what they're saying because he's not speaking in their same language, even though he could if he wanted. Here he is with all of the power, all of these resources at his disposal. And his brothers, they're begging. They're begging for food. They have nothing, and they need it from him. And furthermore, Joseph knows their past. And he has information about their lives as they kneel before him that he could use against them. He could have them exterminated, decapitated on the spot if he so chose. But Joseph does not choose to do that. He is in a very godlike position. And here's another way I think he's a picture of Christ. He has the position to be able to order the execution of these men, the condemnation of these men, but he does not intend to do that. He extends mercy to them. He extends grace to them. So just another way in which he is a picture for us of Jesus when Jesus would come a couple thousand years after Joseph. So you remember back in chapter 42, which is the passage that Stephen talked about. You'll remember this. Joseph had begun this strange process with his brothers that continues all the way through 43 and into chapter 44. The strange process where, as we read it, we're like, what is Joseph doing? Why is he making his brothers jump through these hoops? What is this all about? What is he trying to accomplish? And the motivation for Joseph in all of this that he's doing with his brothers now through these chapters on into chapter 44 is never addressed in a forthright, forthright way in the passage. And so if you're like me, and I know I talked to Jason a little bit about this, there is some, you could come up with different conclusions about what's going on in Joseph's mind as he does these weird maneuvers with his brothers that now actually are going to span over several months. We don't know precisely how long. But why is Joseph doing these things with regard to his brothers? Now, before we talk about what some of those things are, let me suggest a couple possible motivations. Some of you might think that Joseph was toying with his brothers out of spite for them. You know, when I was growing up, at several different points, we had a cat. And cats are good at catching mice. And I remember seeing my cat having caught a mouse, and the cat was literally toying with that thing. It was literally making a game out of it. The mouse is still alive, but the cat is just toying with it. He's playing with it before he dispatches with it. Have you ever seen that? Okay, okay. Is that what Joseph is doing with his brothers? It's one possible motivation. Is that at all on his mind? A second possible motivation. Was Joseph doing this? Was this coming from a place of confusion in Joseph? as he's trying to sort out what is the appropriate thing to do given this circumstance, this crazy circumstance? Is it, you, know, you know how that, that proverbial cartoon with the good angel on one shoulder and the bad angel on another, and the bad angel is maybe saying, yeah, get them, Joe. They deserve it. Execute justice. And the good angel is saying, no, extend mercy, Joe. Extend mercy. Is it possible that Joseph is trying to work all that out? during this strange, unheard of scenario where he's got godlike power over his brothers who are kneeling before him after having terribly mistreated him 22 years earlier? Or are there other explanations? Let's leave that third one open, and we'll explore as we go. Now, do you remember when he showed up? And again, this was Stephen's chapter— the, the brothers show up before Joseph. Do you remember what he first did? He accused them of something. What did he accuse them of? Being spies. Did Joseph know they weren't spies? Joseph knew fully well they weren't spies. He knows they're his brothers. And yet he locks them in prison for three days. Wow, three days. And then after three days, do you know what he does? He, may, he, he draws them out of prison and he makes arrangements for them to have all the food that they can carry back to their homeland for them and for their families. And he sends them back on their way. But he does something first. He puts their own money with which they have paid for this food. He, put, he has it put back in their sacks. 
And he says, one of your brothers are going to be kept in custody here in prison in Egypt as a security. Security for what? He says, when you return, you will bring your youngest brother who yet remained back in Canaan. You will bring him with you or you will not ever see my face again. And so he keeps Simeon there in Egypt as a prisoner. And then the brothers go back home. And of course, when the brothers go back home, they know that there is no way on earth that their father is ever going to let them bring their young brother Benjamin back into Egypt with them if they have to come back for more food. So they know that. But they leave and they, they're heading home back to Canaan anyway. And somewhere along the journey back to Canaan, they overnight, they camp and they open those sacks of food that have been brought. And what do they find? They find their money in their sacks. And you would think, what a windfall, right? But they didn't feel that way at all. They felt very much like all of these strange circumstances that were happening were some way, in some way connected with their guilt, their sins of the past. And Jason did a great job of pointing this out last week as he dealt with chapter 43. And he talked about their guilt and how their guilt caused them to view their circumstances in some certain way and shielded them from seeing the beauty of what God was doing. Because they had guilty consciences, they could only interpret their circumstances in one way. And it was like God was hunting them down or something for what they had done 22 years ago because their, their wrongdoing had never been addressed. And so they lived with this guilt that colored everything. I thought, boy, how many of us in this room can say, yeah, that's been my experience? Because there's stuff that just has not been addressed in your life and it's years old and it colors everything so that you can't even see that God is actually wanting good for you. But you're, fear, you're fearing the worst because of your guilt. Hmm. So they find their money back in their sacks, and they're not at all comfortable with this. It's an interesting thing about our guilt that it makes us imagine things that are not really there. There's an interesting proverb about that, about um, you, you, you jump up at any sound, and because, it's because of your guilty conscience. We cannot rest because of the guilt in our consciences. And as Jason pointed out last week, it spoils our ability to see that God is for us, actually seeking to work good things for us. Okay, now fast forward. They've been back in Egypt now for, oh, who knows, a couple of months. We don't know how long, but long enough to burn through all of the supplies that they had bought down in Egypt. And it becomes clear that the famine has not released its grip. There is still no food, and we are out again and so they realize they're going to have to go back to Egypt and try to get more food. And so they say to their father, Father, we've got to go back. But what does the father say when he remembers the condition? That Benjamin, the youngest brother, the new favorite since Joseph got eaten by wolves or whatever it is they told their father. What does he say? He says, over my dead body, that boy will never go with you back to Egypt. You think I'm going to allow you to lose my other son by Rachel? Like I lost my first son by Rachel? And so he puts up a strong defense against this. And then time passes and he realizes, we're all going to starve to death if I don't let Benjamin go. So finally he relinquishes and he says, okay, you take Benjamin and you go back to Egypt because we need more food. And so the brothers return, this time with their youngest brother Benjamin in tow. And if you think things have been a little strange so far in their interactions with this powerful, mysterious, austere lord of Egypt, they get weirder yet. They show up with Benjamin the second time and this austere lord of Egypt gives orders for these men to be escorted somewhere. Does anybody recall where he has them escorted? To his house. He's the most powerful guy in Egypt. Well, the second most powerful guy in Egypt. And he's got these strangers here wanting to buy food. They're foreigners. 
And he says, I want you guys to be taken to my house. And do you know why he has them sent to his house? For what event? For lunch. So these guys, with their guilty consciences, are thinking, okay, this is not good. This is our sin coming back to haunt us. He is going to ambush us, and he's going to massacre us all. Or, best case scenario, he's going to make slaves of us all. Now, isn't it interesting how they still have slavery on their minds after 22 years? And slavery has probably been on their minds ever since they decided to traffic their younger brother as a slave. It's never gone away. So here they are, very much afraid, being taken to this very powerful foreigner's house, not knowing how this is going to turn out. And when they arrive, Joseph's steward. Do you guys remember when Joseph himself was a steward? Interesting how the tables have turned. Joseph's steward reassures these brothers that all is well. They actually confessed to him, you know, look, look, we bought this food and we gave you our money, but when we got halfway home, we opened our sacks and it was back in there. And I don't, we don't, and he says, it's okay, guys. And he actually says, look, I think I have this on the screen. Yes, this is verses 23 and 24. He says, it's all right. He said, don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Now, this is fascinating to me. Look at Joseph's impact in the land of Egypt. His steward now is talking about the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. And he's saying, this is the God that is responsible for blessing you. They can't see it as a blessing because of their guilt. But he says, your God is blessing you. I received your silver. Take it as a gift from God. This is what the steward basically tells them. Now, the steward continues. Then he brought Simeon out to them. The steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet, and provided fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. Okay, you know what was stunning to me as I was reading through this? I cannot help but notice something pervading this whole scene, something that we sing about all the time. It's a single word. It's a word we use every time we pronounce the name of this church. Grace. Do you see this? Do these men, after what they had done, deserve anything like this from the most powerful person on the face of the planet? They deserve what it is that they dread. But what do they get? They get a banquet prepared for them. They get their feet washed. Just another way, guys, that Joseph is a picture for you of Jesus. He has all the power, and he has all the right to condemn you. But what does he give you? He washes your feet, and he gives you a banquet. Oh, my goodness. So, finally, Joseph arrives for the noon meal. And when he arrives, he begins inquiring about his brother's well-being. You all are well. Uh, yeah, and how about your aged father back in Canaan? How is he? And I got to think that they're scratching their heads, asking themselves, why does he even care about our father? He's an Egyptian. He doesn't know our father. Why is he asking? But they got to be puzzled about this. And then he inquires about their youngest brother. Oh, so is this the little brother you told me about? And at this point, Joseph just cannot contain himself anymore. And whenever I read this story, I am just stunned by the emotion in this man, the pain he has carried around for all of these years and the way it comes out in this moment. Read these verses, and this is still the tail end of 43. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. Boy, he blew it out. Then what's it say? After he washed his face, he came out and controlling himself said, serve the food. Now, just about this time, something very, very strange happens. Joseph's brothers, still not knowing who this man is, they see how they've been arranged around the table. There are 11 of them. 
and they notice that they are arranged around the table in the precise order of their ages. And they think, this cannot be a coincidence. Something is going on here. The firstborn, the secondborn, the thirdborn, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way down to the eleventh in order. Now, you could probably tell a difference between the oldest one and the youngest, but somewhere in the middle, are you kidding me? No way. And they know it's not an accident, but they wonder what's going on. It says they were astonished. We're in a foreign land with foreigners. They don't know us. How did this happen? Joseph's intent here was that, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead there. I lost my place here. They, they, they recognize that they're seated in this way. Now that brings us into the events of chapter 40, which are just a continuation of this strange interplay between this very powerful man and these foreigners who are desperately hungry. In chapter 44, we find that in the morning after the banquet, Joseph sends them away again back to Canaan. And once again, he has filled all of their sacks with as much grain as they could carry. And once again, he has returned their money to their sacks. But this time, he has done something additional. Joseph orders that his special silver goblet, or whatever you want to call it, which in Egyptian culture was the type of a goblet that a holy man would use for divining the future or for fortune telling or 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 like like a palm reader might do with something in egypt that's what this cup was about well joseph had one joseph here he is still playing the part of an egyptian leader has that cup placed in their sack whose sack benjamin's sack and then he dispatches with them And he lets them get down the road about a half a day's journey. And then he turns around and he sends a posse after them. And the posse catches up with them, says, whoa, buddy, wait a minute. We believe you've stolen from the Grand Vizier. What are you talking about? We didn't steal anything. We would never do such a thing. Even the silver that wound up magically back in our sacks last time we brought back, we didn't steal anything. Search us. And by the way, the person in which you find in whose possession you find that silver cup, he dies and we'll all become your slaves, is what they say. And, and the leader of the posse simply says, oh, well, that's a little bit overkill. You all live and let you return. But the person in whose sack we find this thing, that person comes back as a slave. And so they get down all their sacks and they, and they search through it one by one. Again, I assume in order of their birth. And the last sack that they search is Benjamin's. And can you imagine their pain, their shock, the knife to the heart when they pull that silver goblet out of their youngest brother's bag? They are mortified. And they're rounded up, and they are taken back to Egypt, and they are brought before Joseph, and they immediately fall prostrate before him and start begging for mercy. What could be worse for these brothers? Out of all 11 of them, it's Benjamin who's caught red-handed. He looks guilty as sin. And so they're begging before Joseph. Now, let me stop and ask a question. Why is Joseph doing this? Remember those things that we suggested, those motivations that we suggested? And we left a third one open, which is a big catch-all. But it basically is a way for you to let me suggest to you what I think his motivation was. Here's what I think it is. I believe Joseph is sort of sifting his brothers here. I think he's sounding the depths of their souls to see what's going to rise to the top when the heat's turned up. I think he is sort of testing his brothers to see who they have become over the last two decades since they did this to him. He's asking questions in his heart like, are you guys the same men as you used to be? Have you changed? Are you still merciless? 
Are you still cold and calculated and heartless and self-centered? Do you still care nothing at all about how things affect your aging father? Or do you actually care about him now? Well, Joseph gets his answer. I think he also wants to know, do you guys even remember what you did to me 22 years ago? Do you even remember? And how do you feel about it now? I think he wants to know, do you guys have any remorse over what you did to me? He wants to know who these men have become. Now, it's also very clear that over these 22 years, God has continued to work in Joseph's heart. He has kept him from bitterness. He has kept him from hatred. He has cultivated in Joseph what I will call a Christ-like spirit. Because here he is with a chance for big-time payback. A chance to do justice. A chance to enact vengeance. But those things are the farthest things in the world from his mind. Joseph is testing his brothers to see if they've grown and changed into men with whom a relationship might be possible. And what type of relationship? On what terms? Who have you men become? Now, I got to tell you, I think this is about reconciliation. I think Joseph is testing the waters of reconciliation here. And I think that forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Things. And you've heard us talk about this before. See, forgiveness is a posture of, in your heart towards somebody who's done you wrong, which I think that posture can be there regardless of whether that person ever wants to make it right or not. You can release it. Frankly, that's what the original Greek word means. Athiemi means to release, to let go, to send forth. So when you forgive, that's, that's up to you. That's in your heart, regardless of the posture of the person who's wronged you. But reconciliation is something different. Reconciliation is going to require something on the part of those who have wronged you. You can't just waltz back into a relationship the way it was before, even though you've forgiven. Things have changed. Now, reconciliation is different because it doesn't depend just upon you alone. Reconciliation is going to require something on the part of those who've wronged you. And I think that we see Joseph here testing these waters, working toward possible reconciliation with his brothers. Now get this. When Benjamin appears to be caught red-handed, stealing from the Grand Vizier of Egypt, his older brother Judah steps forward. Yes, guys, this is the same Judah who came up with a brilliant idea of trafficking Joseph 22 years ago. And instead of selling, I know, let's sell him. Look what Judah steps up and does here. This is chapter 44, 18 to 34. Let's read Judah's speech because it is magnificent if you can understand it for all the your servants and thy masters and all that kind of stuff. Here's what it says. Then Judah, remember who he is? Then Judah went up to him, Joseph, and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to my Lord. Don't be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, We have an aged father. And there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother's dead, and he's the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. And then you said to your servants, Bring him down so I can see him for myself. And we said to you, my lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, Unless your younger brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Well, when we went back, to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. And then our father said, now there's a whole big skip here. He, he skips the whole part about Jacob having a hard time letting him go. So he fast forwards and he says, then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we can't go down, father. If only our younger brother is with us, will we go? We can't see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. My Lord, 
Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, He's surely been torn to pieces, and I've not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. And now Joseph addresses, or, or Judah addresses his unknown brother again, and he says, So now, if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy is not there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I don't bring it back to you, I'll bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, can you see him pleading? Now then, please, let your servant, that's me, let me remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy's not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Wow. Wow, what a speech. You notice that the brothers have changed. Judah, as a representative of the brothers, has changed big time. Remember when special treatment of the younger brother was an issue that made them mad and wanted to kill Joseph? Apparently that's not an issue anymore. Now they are protective of the father's favorite rather than wanting to bring harm to the father's favorite. Wow, night and day difference, isn't it? Where there used to be cold indifference to how something might affect their father, now there's great concern about how things will affect their father. That's changed. Now they're very willing to admit that they are men who have behaved very wrongly and deserve nothing. That's changed. They seem to grieve over their past sins and not try to defend them. And they are now entirely self-sacrificing self-sacrificing instead of self-seeking. Which is going to lead me to two takeaways. And here's where we wrap it together for you. Guys, there is hope for change. There is hope for change. I was surprised when I saw this. Over two decades, these men as they aged, they changed. Sometimes we lose hope for change in people in our families, for people in our lives. They're never going to change. How many times have you said that? How often do you grow impatient with yourself and you conclude that I am never going to be able to change? Guys, these men changed. Over 22 years, they changed. So don't lose hope. Pray, God, grant us growth. Grant us growth. Keep hope alive. Second thing, this is the last takeaway. That one has to do with the brothers. This one has to do with Joseph. We should, like God and like Joseph, I should add, we should love forgiveness. We should love mercy. And we should maintain hope for reconciliation. We should keep that door open. If we learn anything from Joseph here, is Joseph keeps the door open for reconciliation. He doesn't slam it and lock it and bolt it. He wants it. And so he courts it, and he tries to see if it's going to be possible. So, another lesson for you is just keep that door open. Don't bolt it and lock it. Love mercy. Love forgiveness. It's very Christ-like. Let's pray. Great Father, thank you so much for this extraordinary account. I am so glad this is in the Bible. Lord, we learn so much and are challenged on so many levels by the life of this man. Thank you for it. And Lord, these things that we have seen, these things that we have tried to point out, I pray that you would make them alive for us. I ask you for that, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would ask, I ask that you would make that alive in my own heart, in my own life. 
Lord, so many different things could be drawn, and no doubt individuals in this room are, are hearing from you on different levels than we have spoken about. And I pray that you would make that alive and powerful, those very personal and particular messages. We ask you to go with us and help us to walk with you as we leave this place today. In the name of Christ, amen.